Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 632nd episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, then you probably heard me talk about our Edible Backyard Summit. It's a three-day online food-growing inspiration and education event that brings together thousands of people to learn practical tools for living healthy, self-sufficient lifestyles and growing your own food. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast, then I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to love the Edible Backyard Summit. It's just like the podcast because it's free and you'll learn a lot from experts in their fields. And unlike the podcast, you'll get to see the presentations on your screen and have your questions answered live. The upcoming Edible Backyard Summit airs live September 14th through the 16th with informative presentations that food growers of all kinds will enjoy, whether you are an aspiring newbie or a seasoned expert, and whether you live in an apartment or have acres to grow on. And for this upcoming summit, we're going to do something a little bit different and special. The September 2021 Edible Backyard Summit is best of theme, meaning that we're going to be showing listener favorite presentations from the last two years. These are the cream of the crop presentations that people couldn't get enough of, and this is the only time and place you can watch them for free. You'll learn about some of the best plants to use in an edible landscape, regenerative composting techniques, patio farming for small spaces, how to build healthy soil that makes your plants grow like crazy, an ergonomic straw bale gardening technique, and lots more. To sign up for free, head over to ediblebackyardsummit.com. And if you have friends and family that love to garden, please invite them too. This is a great opportunity to do something fun virtually with other food growers in your life. If you're ready for some fall gardening inspiration for your most vibrant, healthy, and self-reliant life, I invite you to join me for the Edible Backyard Summit. Sign up at ediblebackyardsummit.com and get ready to create the edible yard of your dreams. Today on our podcast, we have someone who doesn't let size determine her harvests. We're talking with Christy Wilhelmy about growing fruit in small spaces. Christy is founder of Garden Nerd, the ultimate resource for garden nerds, where she publishes newsletters, her popular blog, top-ranked podcasts, and YouTube videos. She also specializes in small space organic vegetable garden design, consulting, and classes. She is the author of Gardening for Geeks, 400 Plus Tips for Organic Gardening Success, Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden, which is published by our friends at Cool Springs Press, and her upcoming novel, which I'm very excited about, called Garden Variety, which will be sprouting in April of 2022. Welcome to the show today, Christy. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. Well, so I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, you know, Garden Nerd is my second career. My first one was as a dancer and an actress. And so as, yeah, I know it's weird, isn't it? But as an injury took me out of dance, I had already started building Garden Nerd as a business. And so it made sense to just kind of transition into that afterward. Mm -hmm. And it really took my passion for gardening and environmentalism to new heights where I can change, you know, I'd say, you know, changing the world one garden at a time. Right. being able to share with people information that empowers them to grow their own food mm-hmm. makes me feel like I'm doing that one little thing that I can do on this planet to make a difference. Right. So, so that's and, how I got here. And, and given how much you're out there, because I'm out there pretty much too. I mean, I get input from all over the world. And sometime in the past month or two, somebody has emailed you something that it was like, oh my gosh, this is the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing, right? Tell me about that. Yeah. In fact, I, you know, occasionally I get these kinds of comments on my YouTube channel where somebody, I I have this video about, uh, it's actually a citrus treatment video and Uh it's about how to fix most citrus problems. And 
this guy, he's like, well, I'll give this a try. What the heck? I've got this ailing tree that's not doing any, you know, doing anything. And I'll just give this a shot. And he came back a few weeks later, like a month later. And he's like, it works, all caps. And, you know, it was like, <laughs> I've, I've tried everything I can think of. Nothing else works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this information. It's changed my life. I'm like, all right, my job is done. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So in our pre-talk, you mentioned something called backyard orchard culture. Can you say a little yes. bit about that, how you discovered it, where that concept came from? Backyard orchard culture is something that honestly came to me through somebody you've had on your on your show before, Tom Spellman uh -huh. from Dave Wilson Nursery. I first heard it from him, but I've heard it from other people since. And But the idea of backyard orchard culture is different from what we read about growing fruit in all of the university ag websites and most gardening books because they're geared toward the farmer or right. the large scale fruit grower and nothing is really written for the small scale fruit grower and even for those who have like hardly any space at all and so backyard orchard culture is this idea that starts with the premise of a don't buy a standard size tree, buy something that's either semi-dwarf or dwarf or even miniature if you can find that kind of thing. And then it is the idea of pruning the tree and tree care maintenance that keeps the tree to a height that is no taller than, well, for me, eight, about eight to 10 feet tall because uh -huh. I don't want to get up on a ladder. Right. I think Tom Spellman lets his get 15 feet tall because he doesn't mind right. uh, getting up a little, a little higher. But for me, you know, I look at, I look at all the fruit trees that people have in their yards and they can't reach the top fruit because they let it get 15, 20 feet tall. And there's bird you know, food. nobody can get that. Right. Bird food. Exactly. Squirrel food and where I live. And and basically it's it's not serving the purpose that it should for us. Anyway, it is doing the jobs that trees do, which we love trees for the for the oxygen they circulate and the, and the water they hold in the soil and all of that. But in terms of fruit production, we as homeowners can get a lot more out of the space that we have if we keep our trees at backyard orchard culture height, somewhere between eight and 10 feet. And then there are a bunch of other techniques that you can combine, which we'll talk about, I'm guessing, that allow you to get more fruit in a smaller space and train it, however, a couple of different ways. Yeah. So today, actually, you, we, you came to us via your publisher, at Cool Springs Press. And so what we're talking about today is grow your own mini fruit garden, planting and tending small fruit trees and berries in gardens and containers. And so let's just let's just jump into that and talk about some of these techniques that you mentioned. Sure. So I'll start with the combination planting. So one of the things that Tom Spellman talks about a lot in at Dave Wilson Nursery is the idea of planting several trees in the same planting hole or very close to one another, as in like 18 to 24 inches apart. Mm -hmm. Their trunks are 20, 18 to 24 inches apart. And so you've got this combination or cluster of trees that are all in the same family or same species rather. So like all citrus or all stone fruits, and they're growing together in a really, you know, really compact space and you're pruning the interior of that combination so that there isn't a lot of in the way of crossing branches and you're treating it kind of as one tree or like a hedge mm -hmm. and that way the choices you can make instead of picking one tree you can fit four trees in the space of one or a little bit more than one you can pick an early season a mid-season a late season and then something interesting like an early season plum a mid-season apricot um, peach a late season nectarine and then an apricot which mm -hmm. is that kind of tight window <laughs> right. you know, tiny window or you know your fruit your citrus trees you can do orange lemon lime tangerine all in one combination and that way you're getting a little bit of fruit each uh, and an extended harvest, right? So you're getting, you get, you get each of those trees that come into their ripeness at a different time and you end up with just the right amount and not too much of it. Cause I know people, again, the people who have those big tall trees where they can't reach the top fruit, yep. they also get 400 oranges at once and they have no idea what to do with it. You can only squeeze so much orange juice, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or harvest, or harvest so many apples. I had, so right. I have... I have an Anna apple tree in my backyard, and I've purposefully mm -hmm. let it get tall because I wanted the shade. 
It's in the western uh-huh. quadrant of my backyard, so it uh, it shades my back patio. So I let it get to like 16 feet tall. And this year, we there were so many apples, I didn't know what to do with them. So I actually connected with a local food co-op here in Phoenix, and I harvested and I got it 150 pounds. That's not all that was there. 150 pounds of apples off of one tree, and that's like in a two-week period. So when we're yeah. when we're growing fruit trees, when you're being successful, you're getting a lot of fruit, right? Right. And while that shade is important, especially where you live and and increasingly where I live, most people don't have the skill set to process 150 Mm -hmm. pounds of apples or the counter space or the refrigerator or freezer space. And so this concept of smaller is better is something that I have embraced because it, for the most part, makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, and yeah. right next to my driveway, I have a desert gold peach, which is highly prolific here. And I call it my perfectly pruned peach. And it's about, and right now, this time of year, it's about 11 feet tall. And I'll prune it down to about nine feet tall, you know, doing some summer pruning, which we can talk about. And then, you know, doing the winter pruning. So it works really well. Yeah. And so there are other techniques for people. And I wrote this book for people who are also maybe in an apartment or have just a pat- small patio mm. and don't have a lot of space. And the idea of using the, the trees, or I, su- I should say choosing trees that are suitable for those locations, like multi-fruit trees or espalier trees that mm-hmm. are flat, you know, they grow in two dimensions. And so you can fit that in a one foot strip of soil along a a concrete pathway or a gravel pathway or something like that. And, you know, apples do that Apples really espalier nicely. Um, You can espalier just about anything, but citrus tends to want to grow in a bush format, so it's not as easy. But certainly your stone fruits and your palm fruits, you'll be able to do that and, you know, save on space. Yeah, right? absolutely. So you've you've thrown out a couple of terms that I want you to define. Palm fruits. Okay, palm fruits are your apples, your quince, and your pears. So those are, you know, they're going to, when you cut them open, they have a little star shape in the, in the oh, middle, right? right? I always but, wondered about that. Cool. Yeah. And then, st- um, and then go ahead. Stone fruits. Stone that fruit. What, what yes, the next exactly. One? Right. So, so stone fruits are your, your peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, and it includes cherries, which kind of feel, feels a little off to the side, but it is. And honestly, it should be an avocado should be too, but, I, but those are in subtropicals and right. tropicals. <laughs> They're kind of off on their own. Well, I guess but almonds are too. basically anything that has a pit. Almonds are right. too. Right, and I guess they would be. They are, yeah, they are. And, yeah. and it's funny because I hadn't really come, I didn't use those terms really frequently in my everyday life because I'm focused mostly on vegetables. Mm-hmm. But writing this book gave me the opportunity to do a lot of research and learn a lot more about growing fruits and fruit trees and berries as well. And so those terms, the kind of technical terms for these groups, these families of produce were kind of, fresh for me as well. Nice. Like, oh, I didn't really call it. What's a palm fruit? I don't know. Is right. it a pomegranate? No, actually that's something else altogether. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and then you also mentioned an extended harvest. And that's part of that's part of what Tom Spellman talks about in the backyard orchard culture concept. And so tell us about that. Right. And if again, if you have your favorite tree, like that apple that you've got out there, mm-hmm. that Anna apple, and it produces it's going to produce a specific time of year and it's going to produce for a two week period or maybe a three week period, but not, not very long. You're going to have it all happen at once. And so the idea of choosing varieties that are bred to ripen early mid season or late will extend your harvest season. Your, that gives you an extended harvest Mm -hmm. through a longer period of time. So you're not getting 400 apricots in a two week period sort of, extends, you know, by growing different varieties of that one type of fruit, if you wanted to, if you have room for it in a combination, then, then you can spread out that harvest a little bit more. So it's not really an extended harvest as much as it is an extended range of harvest times. Got it. And what is your favorite one for where you're at? And then I'll tell you what mine is. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for citrus. And everyone's trying to, you know, the Master Gardener program is trying to get people to stop growing citrus because we have the Asian citrus psyllid that's killing off a lot of the citrus trees. But 
I'm hopeful because there is a treatment for it right now. And we've been, there's a the five-year study and I'm rambling, but you can cut me off if you want to. There's a five-year study that concluded where they used an extract, a natural extract from Australian finger lime that, really? that worked better. Yes. And it was, it was killing off the citrus psyllid and protect, it was actually protecting trees from the psyllid better than anything else they've tried. Also, a friend of mine who is a science-based beekeeper and gardener, she found that they did trials by growing alyssum, that umble oh, yes. flower, underneath their citrus trees, and it attracted enough parasitic wasps to oh, yeah. keep it, right? Exactly. It kept, to keep the, the uh, citrus psyllid in check, and it worked better than the chemical treatments they were using. So I'm hopeful, and I'm not going to take out my citrus. Right. Well, and here's the other thing, though. Well, what they're finding here in Arizona and in the low desert is the heat seems to be mitigating the citrus psyllid as well. Well, all right, then. Right. What what heat brings in so much, you know, so much trouble comes from way too much heat. But this is a a benefit, which is great. It is going to wipe out invasive species. That's fantastic. Right. So so when I when I was I started to say my favorite, I'm really I'm a big fan of Meyer lemons and I, I have a navel orange tree out front that I just absolutely absolutely love because we eat these oranges over the sink. They're yeah. so juicy yep. and nothing you buy from the store even comes close right. to them. Oh my gosh. So a friend of mine was here one day and I handed her a bag of the Cara Cara navel oranges off of my trees. And, you Uh know, a big part of the flavor of fruit is how well you take care of the soil underneath, right? So I handed her this bag of Cara Cara navel oranges and she took them home and 20, literally 20 minutes later, she was on the phone with me saying, oh my gosh, Greg, what are these? I said, they're Cara Cara navels. And she said, no, they're not. They don't taste like anything that I get from the store. Yeah. It really makes a difference growing it at home. Huge. Yeah. And the soil. We'll talk about soil. Yeah. All right. We We have so much to talk (laughs) about. Um, So my favorite, my favorite extended harvest here is the desert gold peach, which ripens about Mm -hmm. May 15th. The tropic snow peach or the Suaze swirl peach, which ripens about June 10th. And the mid pride peach, which is I'm going to say this. It might sound funny to some people. The mid-pride peach is our late season peach here in the desert, which ripens at the end of June. Because anything, uh, anything that's a soft flesh fruit here in the desert, if you don't have it off the tree by about July 1st, it's dead. Forget it. Right. Because it just cooks on the yeah, tree. And, and that, you know, to, to kind of refer back to your, your answer, your question about the extended harvest, that the thing about citrus is great is that it can live on the tree. You don't have to harvest right. it. it can, store on the tree and so that is a built-in extended harvest right there you don't have to pull it all off so again that's why i like citrus so much yeah so my three favorite citrus here in the desert are washington navel caracara navels and trovita oranges which are very navel like trovita t-r-o-v-i-t-a and the nice thing is is that my navel oranges start at the end of november so i get them november december january and early february and they like you said they store on the tree that whole time and then the trovita oranges start in january february march so i'm getting december january february march into april i'm getting five months of citrus off of my trees and they're so prolific yeah isn't it great they're so that's the thing about fruit trees that i just love Plant yourself a fruit tree and you'll get decades of fruit off of it and bushels of fruit off of them. Yeah, it's worth the investment, especially worth the time that you take to prep the soil before planting them because that makes all the difference in the world. All right, go there. Talk to me about that. All right. We're going there. So a lot of people get really excited when they buy a tree, I'm sure, from you, right? And you teach your classes to get people to do this right. Mm-hmm. But basically, you know, people go out, dig a hole, and drop the, the root ball in the hole without doing the right kind of soil prep. And they walk away. And, and then they walk away. Yep. And, okay, so there, you know, there used to be, how do I want to say this? There's this school of thought now that you want to plant in native soil. And that is true to the degree that some people will dig a hole and fill the hole with really high quality compost or potting soil and then plant the tree in that and then walk away. And that almost does is almost worse than not putting not amending the soil at all (laughs) because it just sits there in that little bathtub. And it never wants to grow outside of the diameter of that hole that you dug because it's all the good stuff is in there. So to kind of bridge the gap between those two thoughts of planting in native soil and planting in like fake soil that you put in a hole, you really want to amend your soil 
to the degree that, well, I say if you can dig a saucer that is as deep at the bottom as the root ball is tall mm -hmm. out in a, and then sloped sides up to the surface, at least as I think, you know, like three to five foot diameter is ideal. Right. But certainly out to where the drip line is, you know, going to be hopefully in a year or so. And and mix in the best quality compost that you can into that whole space. So then the root ball can reach out into the new space and grow and get nice, deep, solid roots. And then it will, it will thrive. And you're not changing the soil drastically between that cylinder you dug in the ground and the rest of the native soil around it. So that's a big, important thing. Big time. You know what I discovered a couple of years ago that seems to be working really well? What? A square hole. I just saw an article about that. Let's let's talk about that. What yeah. is the why does the square hole work better than a cylinder or a saucer? Well, saucer, I like that idea. I've not heard that before. I like the idea of the saucer on the bottom. But mm -hmm. what can happen with a cylindrical hole is if the soil is too hard on the outside. Exactly. She's she's yeah. Uh, the roots I see, just circle. I see her. <laughs> we're, we got video going on on this side, and the circles the the roots circle around and get root right. bound in that hole. So yeah. the premise is, is that if you dig a square hole, it's not round. And when the roots start going along the edge, they hit the end. And rather than doing a 90 degree turn, they keep digging. Yeah, that makes sense. And the, I think the other thing, and people are often afraid to do this is break up the root ball. When you put it in the ground, mm -hmm. take it out of that nursery pot and break it up. Cause it, sometimes you might even have to cut through some of the root ball. If it's been in that pot for a for really, long. really long time, yeah. it's circling already and roots need direction. And a lot of times people are afraid to muss up the roots in a fruit tree. When it comes out of the nursery pot, some of them are already circling in that pot if it's been in there for a long time. And don't be afraid to pull that root ball apart kind of, you know, either by hand with your fingers or with a, a digging fork or something just to loosen it up. Or some people even cut through old roots with shears yeah. because that just stimulates new root growth. And there's nothing to be afraid of around that. You're not going to kill it. And then when it goes in the ground, it's going to look for where to go next, kind of like that square hole, where to go next. Exactly. Well, one of the things I've noticed is that I've seen less and less root-bound fruit trees in the past couple of years because they're selling so fast. <laughs> you know, our citrus, I'm not surprised. Our citrus that we get in from Yuma for our fruit tree program, there's no root bound going on. And if you break up that, so you have to be careful in breaking up the root ball. If the, you know, if there's not a lot of roots, you have to be to remove it more carefully out of the pot. So breaking up the root ball is, is a, is a symptom of, is it root bound? Is it right? If the, you see a lot of roots, then you need to break it up. If it's really, like you said, younger and doesn't need that, then you just want to kind of massage it a little bit and then drop it in. Yeah. We've talked about keeping the trees small and that's a process. What do we need to do? Well, it starts with, like I mentioned earlier, buying the right size tree for your space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that depends on the rootstock that it's on. So fruit trees are either standard semi-dwarf, dwarf, dwarf or miniature and they're, they're, the size is determined primarily by the rootstock. And then after that, once you've chosen the tree that is going to get 30 to 50% as big as a standard size fruit tree, you're going to want to employ summer pruning for the most part. That is what most trees appreciate most. And that's, that's when you control height and width the most. And then you do your detail pruning in the winter in terms of like cutting out crossing branches and cutting for next year's fruit. So summer pruning is not as detailed. And I'm sure you talk about this with your people of your, you know, your listeners have all heard this probably before, but you're, you're reducing the height by, you know, between there's kind of a non-consensus on how much right? to prune back. Yeah. Yeah. So I did a lot of research and there was no consensus. It was anywhere from 10% to 50%. Mm -hmm. And depending on the species and, and some people wanted you to, you know, take it back by a third or never more by more than a half or only 10%. So I think it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of safe with take never more than a third for me. It's don't take it back by a third, uh, more than a third, but basically, you know, like plum trees they, and apple trees, they shoot up. Oh, yeah. They just want to grow tall. And so keeping that height, keep reducing that height, then that will stimulate new growth for next year's fruit. 
and keep it to the height that you need for, you know, not having to get up on a ladder. I also, also really like to summer prune, especially for stone fruits, because most of them don't like to be pruned like apricots. If you prune them in the winter, they die because they don't, they get wet and they get diseased and then they die. So they only really want summer fruit. I mean, summer pruning. Pruning. Some of them are okay. Like it's mostly like apricots and cherries don't want to be pruned in winter, but summer pruning for them is great. And the other stone fruits like peaches, nectarines, and plums can handle a little bit of, of winter pruning, but you know, be careful. That's what I When that's in wet environments. In wet environments, yeah. If yeah. you're not getting, and well, here we get our rain here in Los Angeles. We get that's when we get our rain is in the winter. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, and I've had so many clients who are like, my apricot de- tree just up and died. And I said, did you prune it in January? And they said, yes. Oh <laughs> I'm wow. Like, well, that's why. Okay, yeah. I've never I've never uh, heard that before because that's when in the dry environment here that's when we want to do a lot of the pruning and they don't we don't yeah. have that problem here in the desert. Mm, that's lucky. That's really right? great. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you probably get a lot of chill hours where you live, huh? Uh, no. No, you don't? So, I mean, well, isn't, aren't your, or we, how long are your winters? I guess that's another subject. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's okay. You mentioned it. We should talk about chill hours because I started my fruit tree education program 22 years ago because you can go into a lot of nurseries and every big box store and they will sell you a fruit tree that will never make fruit where you're at. In fact, I was right. I went to a TV station about a year and a half ago and they asked me to stop at the at the big box store and do a survey of what was being sold at the big box store and whether it would grow and produce fruit here. And over 50% of what they were selling wasn't a right for our environment here. So yeah. I get really passionate about this. So chill hours is one of them. So let's talk about, tell us what chill hours are and why they're important. And then I'll tell you how many hours we get here. So chill hours technically are temperatures over winter that are be- between 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 45 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter, during a tree's dormancy period. And trees, certain trees, require a certain number of chill hours in order to break bud and fruit the following spring. And if they don't get that, they don't produce fruit. So you'll end up with a nectarine tree with lots of leaves on it and no fruit. Yeah. And that is what happens here a lot because here in Los Angeles, we get somewhere between 150 and 300 chill hours on the coast. And yep. maybe, well, you get more on the in, inland. Yes. You get more like 500 or so. Oh, interesting. So that, that works for them. They can do things like that. But here, not so much. So you How need to you? go. You need to go ultra low chill trees because Super chill, chill. chill is yeah. you know for a hundred hours to a thousand hours. There's that window. So if you plant, go ahead. No, I was going to say there. I found that there are some you know pears especially. They need up to twelve hundred chill hours, mm-hmm. and that's why we don't grow those here. <laughs> exactly. So if you if we we get about three hundred and fifty hours, probably more like three hundred hours of chill now in the mm-hmm. in the low desert here. And if you plant, if we plant a 500 or 600 hour chill tree, we're never going to get fruit. Right. So you have to be cognizant of that. Now, I will say that Tom Spellman, when I interviewed him for my podcast, he actually said that he is experimenting. He has an experimental orchard out in Irvine, California, where they are growing a whole bunch of thousand chill hour fruit trees and they are adapting right to their location yeah. and they're getting fruit so it's a thing you know like i have an apple a fuji apple that's up against a wall it gets morning shade uh-huh. it's a 500 chill hour tree but it's producing fruit every year because it's up against this morning it gets this morning oh, shade and so it's a little nice. cooler and yeah, it seems yeah. to be working right there so, so there are ways to to mess with it. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the yeah. experimenting part. So what I do in my fruit tree program is, you know, I bring in these trees and they, and I tell people, okay, if you do what I tell you, you're going to get lots of fruit. There's no experimenting. I've already done all the experimenting. But then that's, you know, that's jumping into the experimenting part, which I'm great with experimenting with fruit trees as long as you know you're experimenting. Right. Right. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, and you mentioned it multiple times, this dwarfing rootstock, rootstocks that are keeping the trees smaller for us. And the problem that we have here in the low desert is is that the dwarfing rootstocks don't do well in the desert. Mm -hmm. So we have to go with a semi-dwarf or a standard rootstock and then prune the trees down. So it's a little bit different, a little bit different game. But tell us about rootstocks. Well, there are rootstocks of 
It seems like there are sets of rootstocks for every country I I researched. Mm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. England has its own set. Canada has its mm. own. You know, it's kind of interesting to find them. There weren't really a lot of commonalities through through across the globe. But what happens is these rootstocks are developed. They're in the same species as the fruit you want to grow, but they are most likely if you were to let that rootstock develop and produce fruit, the fruit would taste awful because it's not like bergamot is usually the rootstock that ci- that citruses are grafted onto or or some some of them are. And the fruit bergamot tastes awful, but right. it's, that's another I, di- I try and I digress. But the a lot of rootstocks are also really good for helping or or suitable for growing in soils that don't drain well or yes. that have certain diseases. Yeah. So that there are particular rootstocks geared towards poor draining soils or disease diseased soils. And it's important to research that you well, first of all, know your soil, right? Yep. Before yep. buying a tree. Do the research, find out what's going on. Is your soil poor draining? Is it got does is it prone to viruses or blah, kind of like water molds, et cetera, like anthracnose and our malaria rot and root, you know, root rot disease and stuff like that. Those can be prevented by choosing the right rootstock and preparing your soil yep. for better drainage. That's there the other go. piece that we should go. probably really talk about. Amen. So, you mean preparing your soil yeah. for proper damage or drainage, not damage? For pro- proper drainage. drainage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, you, you mentioned well, it. it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, it could be damaged if you don't do <laughs> if you don't do it right. So you know what? When it, when I was doing the research on bacterial diseases, fungal diseases, and other like viral and pathogenic diseases, the when you get to the viral and pathogenic diseases, there's no cure. Once they set in, you basically have to pull the tree, pick mm-hmm. a new location, and plant again. Yeah. But the bacterial and and fungal diseases are often preventable, and the and the viral diseases are preventable if you prep your soil properly. Woo-hoo. And what I mean, I know, right? Soil prep is everything. So this is, again, don't just go plant a, a tree in a hole without doing the work. All right, I'm going to stop this you for a sec. Hold that, hold that thought. Yeah, go ahead. So I don't want to walk past what you just said. Soil prep is everything, whether you're planting trees, fruit trees, non-fruiting fruit, trees, anything, yes. vegetables, everything, mm-hmm. herbs, soil, everything. soil prep is the single most important thing that you can be doing, right? All right, exactly. go ahead. Exactly. And yeah, so it is, you know, we're going to get up on the soil food web bandwagon here for a second or soapbox and talk about the, the importance of stewarding your soil food web, the fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, and all the critters that live in your soil. And they are going to, they're the nutrient cyclers, they they aerate the soil, they feed on sugars that the roots put out, they turn into food themselves, and then they become food for nutrient cyclers who then change whatever food you're putting down for the tree into something the tree can absorb. And if you don't have good soil, or if you don't have good drainage, then that is not a good habitat for your microbial life. And so it always comes down to compost, compost, compost. And, and I, <laughs> get this, I get this question a lot. Oh my gosh, I've had mushrooms growing in my yard. How do I kill them? Oh my gosh, that's what you want. I mean, right? mushrooms are an indicator, right? M- mushrooms are an indicator that you have your soil's a little too wet. So just let it dry down a little bit. But the fact that you have mushrooms growing in your soil is like, woohoo, you've got fungi. Fantastic. They are reaching down into deep soils and mining minerals for you without having to dig, which is what you want. Right. So, you know, soil prep, one of the things, and I I am guilty of this myself, having dug the hole and putting the fruit tree in the ground without having done a drainage test or having amended the soil with really good compost to that degree that we talked about earlier out to where the drip line is going to be, whether it's a square hole or a saucer, you know, really adding a lot of compost because compost does, it's that miracle thing that fixes both sandy and clay soil. Mm -hmm. So it acts like a sponge in sandy soil to hold nutrients and create soil aggregates together. And it works in the clay soil to break up partic- particles so that there's more space and drainage for, you know, space for soil to drain well. And it's just also full of microbes. So it's an inoculum 
in your soils as well. And so it does all the things. It does all <laughs> it's like it's all the things are great. Right. And you and you can't really add too much of it, honestly. It, it I've never run into a problem where people have added too much compost to their planting hole before planting your tree. I mean, you know, amended their soil. Amended their soil, tree. yeah. I actually had a yeah. guy on the on the podcast earlier this year who's been doing research at University of Oregon about yes, you can add too much compost. Oh, do tell. Well, we'd have to go back and visit that podcast, but it is it is possible. And I, it, for me, it was, well, and, you know, we're here in the desert. We have less than 1% organic matter in the soil here. Yeah. You know, so. Very little. For, yeah. yeah, for me, that just is a foreign concept. But I guess if you're in a forest. Right. I guess so. Yeah, for places that have really high organic matter in their soil already. Yeah. I know that it can contribute to a different kind of runoff, you know, increased nitrates and that kind of thing as a runoff issue, but not certainly not where I live. I'm in very sandy soil myself, and so we're always adding compost to our blue in the face and then right. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so the drainage test, if you dig your hole and you add your compost and mix it all in, then you want to fill the hole with water and time how long it takes to drain, right? Yeah, we call this we call this a perk test. A perk test, percolation, percolation test, right? Yep. Yeah, and then fill the hole again after it drains and time it again and see how long it takes to drain. And it should drain in less than twenty four hours. And if right. it doesn't, you need to continue to amend your soil until it does. Or make your hole and bigger. Th- or make your hole bigger. Yeah, and a lot of times people don't have the patience for this. They just want to plant the tree, and I get that. I'm excited when I get a tree. I want to put it in the ground right away. But this soil prep thing, and we'll just hammer this into the ground, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. it's the most important part. Because then if you end up getting those diseases later on, it most likely could have been prevented by good soil preparation. Let me share something with you that we have developed at Urban Farm, the Urban Farm Fruit Tree Program over the past 10 years. Yes. And, and get your input on it. And I, okay. oh my gosh, we're just we're just going to keep going here because I mean we're having so much fun. So <laughs> this what is I your tell editor's nightmare. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're not going to edit most of this out. This is great stuff. Okay, um, awesome. What I've found. So we we talked about the square hole. So what I coach people to do is to take and remember we have less than one percent organic matter in our in our dirt here, and mm-hmm. so it's highly dense dirt that we have here. So what I coach people to do is 40% native soil in the wheelbarrow, 60% some kind of compost planting mix, and you mix that up really well. So you got a 60-40 mix there and then it, with a square hole, and then add, an, uh, two, we've, we've shifted it because of the extreme weather, two ounces of mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is soil life, microbes and that kind of stuff. Two pounds of worm castings. Yes. And two, and two pounds of azomite. Azomite is a rock dust. It's like a vitamin pill boost for your tree. And what I tell people to do is mix all of that in the wheelbarrow and plant your tree that way. Yes, that makes sense. I, I was reading an article just the other day that was from someone who had studied mycorrhiza and whether or not it's beneficial to add it. Mm-hmm. I think that they what they discovered is most of the time mycorrhizal products are kind of dead. They're mm. not actually viable. So, it's, you know, make sure your sources are viable and, and test them. I have a microscope, so I can look at something, oh, again, you know, nice. shake it up in water and test yeah, it. under. That's, look that's at that under point. a microscope. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, worm castings, you mentioned worm castings. That is gold. Yeah. And, and it is, not only is it wonderful because it's got that broad spectrum of nutrients, but it also has chitinase in it, an enzyme that helps to fight off sucking insects. And I use that as my first line of defense around any kind of white fly, mealy gu- mealybug, aphids, any of those guys. And hold on, hold on, really hold on. Well. How does yeah. worm castings in the planting hole keep away sucking bugs that are sucking on the leaves? That's what I want to know. Let's talk about that. So <laughs> sucking insects are sucking the juices out of the plant, right? Right. And when you put down, when you put down worm castings, the plant takes up through its roots this the enzyme called chitinase, it's spelled chitinase, but it's pronounced chitinase. Uh-huh. Chitinase is this enzyme that dissolves the exoskeletons of soft-bodied insects. What? And so as the tree, I know, and this is something I use in my vegetable garden all the time because it is the thing I put down when I see some plant struggling. So if I see an eggplant covered in oh. mealybugs or anything like that, or you know what people see most of the time 
is a hibiscus covered in white fly underneath. Yep. We just jet blast off and put down worm castings and you'll see an improvement because wow. they start intaking the chitinase and they're like, why am I falling apart? And then they leave. That's my little okay. story about chitinase. Okay, 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 okay. Hold on here. <laughs> I've been gardening for 45 years and I never knew that. This is why I love chatting with people like you on my podcast because I get to learn new stuff. And this is something that I found out years ago. It was actually the first person I heard it from was Jeff Lowenfels of Teeming with Microbes. Oh, right. Of course. He talked about it. Yeah. He wrote Teeming with Microbes with a, another fella, yep. Lewis. Uh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, and they, they were talking about the power of chitinase in worm castings. Because uh, not only is it really dense in nutrients, mm -hmm. but it has this enzyme. And the enzyme, and then I've seen it verified in a couple of other of other places along the way as I as I was teaching this myself. And you know, insect frass is another source of mm -hmm. yes. Well, it's a source of chitin, but it's also got you know, some chitinase in it. Anyway, I digress. It's my first line of defense against sucking insects, whether it be in fruit trees or in vegetable gardens. Wow. All right, it's an enzyme. I just looked it up real quick. It is, yes. That degrades chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. I guess right. that's in the insects, and, right? And the insects are made of chitin. Wow. Their Their exoskeletons are made of chitin. Wow. So, so it's spelled C-H-I-T-I-N-A-S-E. So we'll put those that's in the correct. show notes. Wow. Well, I know yeah. that we could, I mean, we've been going for 45 <laughs> minutes now, and I know we could chat for another two or three hours. But I need, we need to shift, and we'll have you come back and do some other things because we're having this. Uh, I'm just having way too much fun. Too much fun. So yeah. I do want to shift on you, and I want to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Oh, man, which time? I, right? I feel like I failed a lot. Well, you know, you, t you mentioned experimenting early mm -hmm. on, and I do a lot of that, and so the, therefore there is a lot of failure. And so I will mention... <laughs> this one time, I somehow forgot that you're supposed to stop watering potatoes when they st when the foliage starts to die back. Oh. And it was dying back, and I was like, oh, it must need more water, and I just kept <laughs> watering it. And then I, right? I ended up with a 4x4 four four bed, an entire 4x4 four four raised bed of putrid, rotting tomatoes. It smelled like a garbage heap. It oh, was my awful. gosh. So I won't you only do that once, really. Right. So you learn to yeah. pay attention to the watering. I learned to pay attention to when a plant is dying off, like that's what it's supposed to do. And yeah. I just like, now I know to cut off the water and it's kind of the same for onions, garlic, shallots. You yep. do the same thing where yeah. you cut back the water when it starts to die back. And that's, it, that's its own process of, of shifting gears. Yeah. So I've become more observant of that kind of stuff. Nice. And what do you consider your biggest success? Oh, you know, you mentioned my my novel at the beginning uh, in my intro, and I I have to say I spent so many years working on this novel, and I got eighty nine rejections oh before gosh, I found really? <laughs> before 89? I found my agent eighty nine, and and I and that was that was I probably got more than that, but that's how many I recorded before my agent wrote me back and said, I love this. It needs work, but I love this. And I want, and then, and you know, in my wildest dreams, I wanted to have it published by a big five publisher. And within two and months, got it. she came back with an offer from Harper Collins for oh my from gosh. their imprint, William Morrow. So when you say, what is the thing you're most proud of? I am so proud of this book that I feel like now that it's off to the printer, I could die today and I would be okay with that because I know that it's nice. going out there. Wow. Yeah, all right. So yeah. you know that we're all going to love this book and we're going to need more because when I find it, <laughs> well, when, I, when, when I find an author that I love, it's like, okay, when's their next book coming out? When's their next book coming out? Well, I have started writing the second, the second installment. I plan for this, this garden variety is going to be a trilogy. And I've already started. I've got about 3,800 words written on the second wow, installment. So cool. That's, All right. How many uh, words are in the, the first one? Oh, gosh. It's, it, it went through so many drafts, 15 drafts, by the way, to get it to where it is now. And, wow. and it, it went from like 72,000 words down to 70, up to 74,000. And so it's somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. And I don't oh, remember excellent. anymore. Yeah. Excellent. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. And what drives you? 
You know, I was supposed to be a performer as a dancer. I was supposed to be a performer. And I still feel that. I still feel like my purpose on the planet is to to entertain and to give people information and help people learn and be curious. And I think I'm fulfilling that with Garden Nerd. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> yeah. So that drives me forward. And I think somewhat selfishly, I don't have children. So this is my legacy. And so mm, yeah. all of the content that I put out and the books and the YouTube channel and the podcast and everything is just my, my little legacy, a way of being here, like making my imprint and av- after I'm gone, yeah. you know, that my re- may remain after I'm gone. Right. Oh boy. I can get yeah. that. Awesome. And if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? You know, it's a book that came out Many years ago, but I found it so life-changing and inspirational. It's Barbara Kingsolver's Animal Vegetable Mm, Miracle. And the the whole way that it's written actually was one of the inspirations for me writing Garden Variety. And the way that she talks about eating local changed the way that I shop. And I think everyone could benefit from understanding this idea of eating local and where our food comes from. I mean, you're, you're, this is a listener group of people who do this already. So I'm speaking, Amen. preaching to the choir, yeah. but still it in so many ways influenced how I shop for groceries that I don't grow and how I cook food and how everything, just everything really. Yeah. So read nice. it if you haven't. It's very entertaining. Barbara King Solver is one of the best writers out today. She's yeah. wonderful. And she's a novelist who then wrote this nonfiction book. Wow. She's great. Excellent. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Here's an interesting piece of advice that you may not have gotten from anyone else before. Grow something purple. I am a huge fan of any stinking purple vegetable there is. And I am such a, a, like I grow 14 different varieties of kale most of them have a purple uh, stem or leaf or tinge or something and because they're interesting and different and you know heirloom and open heirloom and open pollinated varieties are where it's at as far as i'm concerned and purple is the most beautiful accent in the garden nice all right so you mentioned 14 different kinds of kale do you grow tree kale i do i have two tree kale sections in my garden and I, the tree collards, tree kale, however you want to call them. Unfortunately, the rats have decimated them. Mm. They had for years, had never discovered my tree kale. And then a couple of years ago, they started finding it. And they're just like sticks now because mm. the rats have been so, so bad this year. And I don't know about you, but during COVID here, uh, the population of vermin exploded. I don't and know why so it did here too. <laughs> well, because we stepped away and... Because they're, because humans extracted themselves from the equation, animals had a chance to increase their breeding cycles, in some cases, threefold, fourfold. Wow. There's this, there's this really great documentary, uh, a one-hour documentary that David Attenborough did called The Year That the World Changed or something like that. I should remember what this is called. But it's about the year of COVID where people went away. And he illustrates all of the different species that have some of which have come back from the brink of extinction because they were able to reproduce uninterrupted by our boats or our trains or cars or people and all of that stuff. So I think that's what happened during 2020. And now they're eating everything. Yeah. What do you you mean that people went away? Well, when we were on lockdown Mm -hmm. during, during lockdown, the streets were empty. The, you know, people weren't the cars, boats, we're not in the water. Mm -hmm. Airplanes were not in the sky. You know, there's, there was less of a presence of human impact on the planet. And, and so the wildlife was able to restore a little bit. So we are seeing the results of that right now. Wow. In our gardens. Yeah. Wow. So where do you get, uh, I'm really curious about tree kale because I've grown it once here. I had a cutting from a friend I tried to make cuttings and wasn't successful at them, so I can't get it. Where do we get tree kale at? 
You know, I did a search because I used to get it from Bountiful Gardens, which yep. is no more. Yes, um, exactly. Peaceful Val- it's, yeah, so John Jevons Grow Biointensive Ecology Action Store. They shut that part down, although he may bring it back. He told me when I interviewed him last year, two years ago. But the tree collards, I did search online, and there are a few places that are selling them through mm-hmm. the mail, mm-hmm. mail order, nothing local. And, you know, I think you could probably find them on also on eBay <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, as well. So tree kale gets but, six, yeah. eight, ten feet tall. And yeah, dinner, mine are about ten feet tall. Yeah, yeah. and dinner plate size leaves and, yeah. and grow for multiple years, right? Yes, they do. They, they're they a perennial kale, and they grow for usually about four years before they get a little too wonky and you need to start over. But every time I cut off a, a branch, you know, in a whole, I'll take the growth, the apical tip and yep. just jam that in the soil and it'll, you know, pull all the leaves off except the one and then jam that in the soil and protect it because the rats love mine oh, too yeah. and water it every day. And then they usually, you get like two or three that take off. Perennial, perennial vegetables and perennial fruits are really important in hot places, hot, dry places, because they are more resilient to drought and climate change and all of that. So yeah. go in the di- going in that direction will not hurt. Amen to that. And like I said, we could talk forever because we're having so <laughs> much fun. So thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Christy. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. We're going to do this again and again and again, I think, because th- we have so much that we can share with each other. So how do our listeners find you? This is important. Yes. You can go to gardennerd.com, G-A-R-D-E-N-E-R-D.com. And you'll find us on Instagram and Twitter at GardenNerd1, Facebook at GardenNerd.com. And the Garden Nerd YouTube channel is just look for Garden Nerd. You'll nice. find us there. And that's Garden Nerd, one word, one N. Correct. Although uh, I do own the domain name for two Ns, just in case. Woohoo! Good job. That's, that's important, <laughs> yeah. actually. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash garden nerd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.